was it like for him to fly from New York to Paris in 1927 solo, really risking his life in those days? And how did it change him? It, it really changed the world's perception of what aviation could do and ushered in the, the golden age of aviation. But I wondered about it on a personal level. My name is Eric Lindbergh. I uh, run an electric propulsion company. We build electric uh, motors for aircraft, and I run the Lindbergh Foundation. Oh, I have some great recollections of my grandfather. Um, he he just seemed he was old and softer, I think, than uh, like my mom had a much harder um, impression of him. I think he could be a hard man. Um, he knew a lot, like he knew everything, <laughs> that kind of guy. Uh, but he was fun with kids. And I remember he would come from the airport and bring uh, peanut brittle or corn nuts, things like that. And that would thrill us kids. And you know, I don't think I really knew who my grandfather was when I was a child. I heard there was something about him that made people nervous and really interested or um, you know, they would just get excited in one way or another when they heard about my grandfather. And I, I didn't really get it until I was much older, I think, 21, mid-20s. Um, you know, I had some other kids in my elementary school read a book about him. And, you know, so I knew he was special. He had something about him. But it was this sort of unspoken thing. And I didn't really get it until I started reading both The Spirit of St. Louis and, and his other books, and then, and then reading more about him from other people and learning more from other people. So my grandfather was a mail pilot here in St. Louis and, and flew the mail back and forth to Chicago. been hanging around Chicago or St. Louis in the winter, he flew that route and, and um, you know, using super primitive airplanes, surplus World War II Jennies, and um, somehow stayed alive and, and really was thinking about the future uh, of flight when he decided to go after this prize, the Ortega Prize, fly from New York to Paris. And um, he wanted to promote the usefulness of aviation. The prize was a carrot. He wanted to win the prize money, but it cost almost that amount to do the flight. So it really was a, a, a promotional event. Um, and he couldn't have done it without having backers here in St. Louis. So the people he worked with, Lambert and um, the local business people, Harry Knight and uh, J.D. Wooster, I might be getting the names wrong, but but there was a core of businessmen that he attracted to, to raise the money. So uh, I think it was seven or nine St. Louisans came together and along with my grandfather and his life savings, they bought the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, he had it built in San Diego at the Ryan Aeronautical Factory and he flew it back to St. Louis to visit his backers and, um, and then on to New York. And, and the funny thing happened in New York the weather shifted and all of a sudden it looked like it was possible for grandfather to fly from Roosevelt Field and he, there was, but there was a problem. One of my favorite stories uh, in Lindbergh's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Spirit of St. Louis, has to do with St. Louis. 
Lindbergh was ready to take off from uh, Roosevelt Field on Long Island. And there were two other contestants for the Ortique Prize who were also ready to take off at the exact same time. One is Admiral Richard Byrd, a famous explorer of his day, and the other was Clarence Chamberlain. And in fact, Chamberlain was going to do this trip in the plane that Charles first thought he would use, tried to buy uh, to do that flight. So he's in a race, he's in a contest. And Lindbergh writes, with each passing day I realize that my greatest strength lies in my supporters in St. Louis. And he told the story. He said, it, it turns out that the Ortique Prize had a notice requirement, much like the X Prize had. You had to tell the organizers with a certain amount of time uh, what your plan was. From, and there was a time from when you registered until when you could be eligible to win the prize. Lindbergh realizes that although he's ready to go and he's really paying close attention to the weather more than the other contestants, if he goes now, he's not going to be eligible to win the $25,000 because the time is not, the notice period is not really enough. And he talks about in the book um, calling back to his supporters, to Harry Knight, who was his uh, main liaison with the rest of the new spirit or, or the spirit of St. Louis organization. And he said, essentially, I called Harry and I let him know that if I were to fly right now, I wouldn't win the prize, which was the basis for, for their relationship. He said, Harry doesn't hesitate for a second. To hell with the money, Slim. When you're ready to fly, you fly. And it gives me chills because today, in, in, in the time period of the X Prize in the last 20, 25 years, here in St. Louis, people of that same strength and character supported us. 50 St. Louisans and 50 people from outside St. Louis signed up to be members of the new spirit of St. Louis organization, and that was our seed money for starting the X Prize effort. The X Prize Foundation uh, is an organization that we created to get human spaceflight unstuck from the notion that only governments could do it. And the technique we used to get it unstuck was the direct result of our reading Lindbergh's wonderful Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Spirit of St. Louis. What was it like for him to fly from New York to Paris in 1927, solo, really risking his life in those days? And how did it change him it, it really changed the world's perception of what aviation could do and ushered in the, the golden age of aviation. But I wondered about it on a personal level and that got me excited and I was talking to my friend Greg here. We were working on the XPRIZE Foundation here in St. Louis and um, I said, what do you think if I flew across the Atlantic? We could use it as a fundraiser for the XPRIZE, talk about the future of flight and. I wanted to give a message of hope to any, you know, kids, especially that were facing adversity, that that there was a chance that modern technology could give them a second chance at life. And I had actually gotten a second chance, and I didn't know if I was going to get a third chance at life. So that sort of propelled me into walking in my grandfather's footsteps on the 75th anniversary of his flight. One of the things that that came out of the Lindbergh saga was the X Prize. Correct. All right, so I'm the co-founder of the X Prize okay. Foundation. And in fact, I gave a copy of Spirit of St. Louis to my business partner, Peter Diamandis, okay. after he and I went flying together, I took him up flying up the Hudson River, and he got excited and I, I and said, I'm gonna finish, he, he stopped being a student pilot because he was busy getting a medical degree and other trivial crap. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, he got so excited that he said, I'm going to finish Greg of it. So I gave him a copy of Spirit of St. Louis to encourage him to finish his mm -hmm. flying lessons. And he didn't read it for like three years. His parents invited him to go with them to, a, to Greece, where they had grown up. So Peter is literally two minutes from the taxi picking him up to take him to the airport. He's throwing stuff in his, in his suitcase. And he realizes he's, he doesn't go on vacation, so he says, I'm going to be gone for like 10 days. I got time to read a book. I should take a book with me. He took that one, took Spirit. And he learned about, the, he didn't know that Lindbergh was pursuing a prize. Oh, the Ortiz prize. prize. Yeah. yeah. 
So when he found that out, he got all excited. He, when he came back, he said, Greg, we ought to do, and I'd been telling people for years in the space world, I've been saying that, that the commercial space industry, which I was part of, needed a Lindbergh-like event. Yes. So Peter comes back and says, why don't we do a prize like the prize Lindbergh? And of course, that spoke to me, and, and he and I created the X-Prize Foundation. People often approach me and say, um, you must have been born with an airplane in your hand or in an airplane and you knew how to fly all the time. It really wasn't obvious to me to become an aviator. In fact, I think that my grandfather's fame sort of worked against us in some way because that fame ha held tremendous burden. And, uh, you know, for me to think about going into aviation as a career was sort of taboo, it was almost unspoken, and I didn't really get it until I was 24. And a friend of mine kept bugging me to go take an introductory flight. He was doing it, he was getting his pilot's license, and he bugged me so much, I finally did it and went, oh, I like this, and I want to do this, and I, I could probably do what my flight instructor is doing. So I, I went and got my private license and then my commercial certificate and, and went on, and I, you know, so I think, for my dad, it was opposite. He went underwater and, and did a lot of exploration undersea and was just as adventurous as my grandfather, just in a quieter way, um, in an opposite field, you know. My dad um, helped pioneer the use of compressed gases in diving, deep sea diving and, and underwater habitats and uh, aquaculture, you know, his career morphed over the years, but. Um, he definitely went sort of opposite of my grandfather, you know, undersea, and, um, and did it very quietly, fairly quietly. The genesis of the Lindbergh Foundation, uh, friends of his after, after my grandfather died, uh, Neil Armstrong and General Jimmy Doolittle and others at the Explorers Club said, we need to carry on this vision. It's really groundbreaking and important. And so in 1977, they, they uh, founded the Lindbergh Foundation and um, it's been 45 years in operation and we're, we're excited to be planning for the 100th anniversary in, in five years. I'm currently serving as the chairman of the Lindbergh Foundation and we're preparing for the 100th anniversary of my grandfather's flight. Um, it was incredible to be a part of the 75th and really play that role of flying across the Atlantic. Um, I think we gained, with that program, a half a billion media impressions. And it all focused sort of on the future of flight and XPRIZE and um, that idea of giving hope to kids who are facing adversity. Um, and so we're really asking that question right now. How do we not only celebrate a meaningful event in the world, but how do we do something really positive with that? Yeah, the plane was... Uh, it was named the Spirit of St. Louis, and it was named after, essentially after the Spirit of St. Louis organization. The plane that Eric used in, in 2002 was a Columbia 300 that was called the New Spirit of St. Louis. And through all this, we met Don Wiegand. Uh, 2001, when I met with Eric Lindbergh, uh, grandson. We were sitting here in the studio and uh, we'd met because he was talking about the flight that he was going to reenact uh, in 2002, celebrating the 75th anniversary of his grandfather's flight. He was amazing meeting him and talking about that, which would have been flying a single engine plane across the Atlantic. We were meeting here before that and I had been working with his family in the Lindbergh Foundation since 1982, again, as I mentioned. But uh, Eric had mentioned, could I, would I be interested in doing something that would be a, a very big symbol f directly for the Lindbergh Foundation uh, themselves? So that they had something called the Lindbergh Award at the time, which I was aware of. And um, I said, well, maybe I, I should do the bar reliefs that I've been thinking about for years. So I created two bar reliefs, a depiction of the Spirit of St. Louis, which is this one right here, and a, a bar relief portrait, uh, profile portrait of Charles when he was 25 years old. And, uh, and I learned that Don was one of the 
secret weapons of the uh, Lindbergh Foundation. And uh, I was invited to join the board and I am now the vice chairman of, the, of that foundation. So Don continues to help the foundation in many, many ways. If I had the chance to, to talk with Charles Lindbergh, what might I say to him? And I've jokingly said, I might say something like, thanks for messing up my life. And what do I mean by that? Um, certainly not for messing up my life, for enriching my life. I was 14 when I read Spirit of St. Louis the first time. In one of the first days of, of high school, I had a whole new library. I was very excited because I lived in a rural area. I'd, I'd read all the stuff in my little local library that I had access to. And one of the first books I discovered in my high school was Charles's book, Spirit of St. Louis. And I never dreamed that it would have the impact it's had on my life. It, it, it caused me to become a pilot. At a, uh, I sold it at age 16 before I could drive a car, which was pretty embarrassing at the time. Um, and I never dreamed I would have the chance to uh, work with so many of the astronauts, to teach with Buzz Aldrin, to, to lecture with Neil Armstrong, and, and one of the founders of the Lindbergh Foundation. Um, to meet Reeve Lindbergh, the daughter of Charles, and to be a business partner, as it were, with Eric Lindbergh and be his flight director when he recreated his grandfather's flights in 2002, after I was unsuccessful in talking him out of that dangerous adventure. Encountering Charles as a, uh, a young person meaningfully changed my life. And I also grew up in a world where aviation was commonplace, and that was a result of Charles's work. It wasn't commonplace before, but he changed the way everybody thought about flying. And it enabled my colleagues and I to change the way everybody thought about space flight, which helped ignite this present commercial space revolution. So the Lindbergh legacy is really powerful and continues to this day. And it's also enabled me to, to meet wonderful St. Louisans and see that the spirit of St. Louis is still alive and well and that people are the entrepreneurial spirit of the St. Louis community and their willingness to get behind uh, unknown young folks and propel them to do great things is, is amazing. Can you imagine that people here in St. Louis in 1926-27, back a 25-year-old airmail pilot who's going to fly a single-engine plane uh, against all these well-known folks, and they do it. It changes everything. And when Peter D. Mandis and I walked around St. Louis in the 90s, asking people to join our new Spirit of St. Louis organization, and hand over $25,000, the amount of the original Ortiz Prize, so that we could make private spaceships happen. As I say it now, in 2022, it doesn't sound so silly, because there are private spaceships, but there were none then. And instead of throwing us out on our ear, people, you know, they were either polite or they said, yep, we'll do it. And they changed history in this century.